Um, and thank you all for for coming and uh, being here on this on this wild wild ride. I think this is the wild ride uh, that I've been uh, kind of gearing up for for three years. Um, but I think you all know that I have spent about a decade writing about energy and the environment. And a lot of that time, I was criticizing the government's failures on policy matters. And um, with, with reason, it's a, it's a you know, understandable thing given our, uh, our, our politics in re recent years. But I, I came to realize that I was as much to blame as everyone else. Um, I, I was doing the right things. I was trading in my SUV uh, for a Prius and shopping at Whole Foods and, and, and uh, going to yoga and, and, and really felt like I had been sort of exonerated from any energy guilt. And, and then I had a, a pretty striking realization um, one morning that I'll describe to you in my first uh, little excerpt. Um, that uh, you know led me to realize that that my relationship with fossil fuels was far more intimate than uh, than the car I drive, uh, and uh, and and that is is coming up. But in the meantime, um, I wanted to give you just a quick you know overview of the book, which is I wanted to step outside of politics and and look at energy uh, you know up close and personal. And, and think about this issue, you know, outside of the, the, the political screeds and, and, um, and the complaints and, and tell a story, um, which was a, a major step for me and, and a very interesting kind of journalistic challenge. I went to deep sea oil rigs and Kansas corn farms. Um, I went inside the electricity grid and into the Pentagon. Um, I went into high-priced uh, plastic surgery operating rooms and, um, and into the innovating, you know, laboratories of the future. Uh, and the story of Power Trip is really the story of this journey. And I hope to give you a little glimpse of that. Uh, but let's start with my, you know, striking realization, which was uh, very exciting. This one morning in my office, um, I took a, an intimate... Uh, an intimate tour of my own uh, personal environment. Since nearly all plastics, polymers, inks, paints, fertilizers, and pesticides are made from petrochemicals, and all products are delivered to market by trucks, trains, ships, and airplanes, there was virtually nothing in my office, my body included, that wasn't there because of fossil fuels. There I sat on a desk made of formica, a plastic, wearing sweatshirt made of fleece, a polymer, over yoga pants made from lycra, ditto, sipping coffee shipped from Zimbabwe, eating an apple trucked from Washington, surrounded by walls covered with oil-derived paint, jotting, ink, jotting notes in petroleum-derived ink, typing words on a petrochemical keyboard into a computer powered by coal plants. Even the supposedly guilt-free whole grain cereal I had for breakfast and the veggie burger I ate for lunch came from crops treated with oil-derived fertilizers. My purse yielded another trove of specimens, capsules of extra-strength Tylenol made from acetaminophen, a substance like many commercial pain relievers that's refined from petroleum, glossy magazines and a packet of photographs printed with petrochemicals, mascara, lip balm, eyeliner, and perfume that, like most cosmetics, have key components derived from oil. I'd understood this intellectually before, that the energy landscape encompasses not just our endless acres of oil fields, coal mines, gas stations, and highways, as well as a vast network of copper wires that feeds electricity to our homes and offices. It's also the corn fields in America's heartland, the battlefields of Iraq, the medical labs that produce penicillin, novocaine, chemotherapy drugs, and many other treatments and cures. It's the cosmetic shelves and glossy magazine racks in our drug stores, it's the constantly humming behind the scenes network of ships, planes, trains, and trucks that transport products to our store shelves. It's even our own bodies, which we routinely drape in synthetic fabrics like spandex and nylon and feed with crops that were fertilized by fo fossil fuels. What I hadn't fully managed to grasp was the intimate and invisible omnipresence of fossil fuels in my own life. The plastic sutures that stepped up, 
stitched up my split lip when I was seven, the photographic CAT scan images that evaluated my concussion after an accident when I was 27. Once I connected the dots between so many seemingly disparate elements of my life, my car, my clothes, my email, my makeup, my burger, even my health, I saw an energy landscape far more vast and complex than I'd ever imagined. I also realized that this thing I thought was a bad word, oil, was actually the source of so many creature comforts I use and love and so many survival tools I need. It seemed almost miraculous. Never had I fully grasped the immense versatility of fossil fuels on a personal level and their greater relevance in the economy at large. You'll, you get a sense from that um, passage that what I've written is, is kind of a love story. <laughs> I like to joke that the book is, is Eat, Pray, Love meets Guns, Germs, and Steel. Um, and uh, you, you, some of you might be familiar with Eat, Pray, Love. It's kind of this woman's search for enlightenment. And, um, and, 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 you know, Guns, Germs, and Steel is clearly a very serious nonfiction book. And, you know, this was, these were parallel stories in Power Trip um, to kind of search my own, for my own understanding of this topic and you know to search for its America's relationship to it and its role in our lives. Um, so when you see the ubiquity of this, these these fuels, these resources in our lives, you have to ask the question: you know, how do we get here? Um, why are we addicted? Why does this make sense? And um, and the the book starts on an oil rig 200 miles off the coast of Louisiana. Um, where I'm, I'm witnessing these drilling engineers burrowing, um, you know, a three-inch drill bit, thirty thousand feet into the into the seabed, and um, and they're going to great lengths. Um, it's a it's a very different scenario than you know a hundred years ago when you could kind of pop a straw on the ground and release a gusher in this country. We were the Saudi uh, Ara Saudi Arabia of the world, and that was a, an, an amazing revelation to me. Up until 1970, we were, um, you know, the single biggest producer of oil. It was incredibly cheap. It was easy to get, easy to transport around the country, and um, it gave our country an amazing, you know, economic boost uh, and 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 uh, you know industrial versatility to have that resource so immediately available. Uh, we're still we're still living like we're the Saudi Arabia of the world, and that that's a problem. Um, that's that's where you know we, we get into these questions, these, you know, this this big debate about oil dependence. Um, but I think that you know the the lesson there, the lesson that I learned there is that energy built us up. It built our cities. It built our industries. Um, it gave us freedom of mo movement. Um, it gave us, you know, a tremendous, you know, economic advantage, a military advantage um, in, in, in the industrialized world. Um, today, we use about 35 percent more oil than Europeans, um, about nearly 50 percent more oil per day than the people of Japan. Those are, you know, our, our industrial counterparts and still, you know, they're, they're, they're living very comfortable lives but, you know, using a lot less. Um, and I, 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 you know, find that very scary. Obviously, when we're looking at a future where oil is getting, you know, increasingly expensive, um, and fraught with, you know, environmental and political problems, why are we so much more addicted? Well, it makes sense. You know, it makes sense that that we got here because it was easy for us to get here because we had, you know, this tremendous advantage of of these resources in our lives. But before we examine the abuse of these fuels, we have to understand our use of them. You know, we have to understand why they matter, why they're useful and versatile in our lives. Um, and I think it's going to make it a lot easier for us to move away from them when we have, you know, a certain um, respect and, and understanding of, of what makes them important.